Hey everyone, Alistair here. I hope you're doing okay. The summer months are upon us, which means two things. Sunblock and hats for me, and that this is the part of our year when costs are high and support tends to dip. We know things are tight everywhere for so many reasons, and that includes us. For those of you who support us already, thank you so much. We hope you're enjoying the great new Catscast episodes. If you don't support us, but you'd like to join the ranks of those that do, we have a ton of options for you at Patreon and PayPal. Even a one-off at Kofi makes a big difference, or check out our new swag store. Maybe, like me, you're always in the market for a couple of cool new t-shirts. It really does all add up, so please, if you can, help us bring you the best in free audio fiction every week. Thanks, and enjoy the episode. Escape Pod, Episode 849. There are no hot topics on Wupai. By Andrea Cruz. Welcome to Escape Pod, your weekly science fiction podcast. I'm your host this week, Tina Connolly, and I'm here to bring you There Are No Hot Topics on Wukai by Andrea Chris. This story first appeared in Lightspeed. Andrea Chris is a PhD scientist in biological and biomedical sciences based in Massachusetts. Her stories have appeared in Clark's World, Lightspeed, and Asimov Science Fiction, among others. Her short story collection, Learning to Hate Yourself as a Self-Defense Mechanism, is coming out from Interstellar Flight Press. Find her online at andreacriz.wordpress.com or on Twitter at The World She Saw. Your narrator this week is Valerie Valdez. Valerie Valdez is the co-editor and occasional host of Escape Pod. She lives in an elaborate meme palace with her husband and kids, where she writes, edits, and moonlights as a muse. She enjoys crafting bespoke artisanal curses, playing with swords, and admiring the outdoors from the safety of her living room. Her short fiction and poetry have been featured in Uncanny, Time Travel Short Stories, and Nightmare. Her debut novel, Chilling Effect, was shortlisted for the 2021 Arthur C. Clarke Award and was also named one of Library Journal's Best SFF Novels of 2019. Join her in opining about books, video games, and parenting on Twitter at Valerie Valdez or find out more at CandleInSunshine.com. Your audio producer this week is Summer Brooks. This story's content deals with colonialism. So get ready to don your VR goggles, because it's story time. There are no hot topics on Wukai by Andre Kriz, narrated by Valerie Valdez. The day the D-Mods shut down skeleton caves, Esko put on her VR goggles and slipped into the Wukai Space Colony's main chat room to figure out what was going on. All the Wukaians who'd made their living off the popular Terran MMORPG, D'Artagnan, had the same idea. Beside her, on top of her, avatars logged in, an absolute pandemonium of photorealistic 8-bit anime animals and humanoids and everything in between. The two main gold farming clans had already started fighting among themselves. How many times did I tell you PKers? the head of Esco's clan screeched. To leave the Terran players alone. It don't matter how many Terran players we killed, leader of the rival Hunter Fam roared, when you idiots kept giving us away by speaking Chinese. We must speak Terran languages. That's why all the Terran players reported us to the D-Mods. 
Esco tore off her VR goggles, tossing them onto her bunk. The interior of her sleeping pod, one toy block in a cluster of thousands, flooded back into view. A storm had kicked up outside, clogging her porthole with Wukai's trademark scarlet soil. She didn't have time to waste arguing over whose fault it was that Dart's most lucrative money-making method had been nerfed. She needed to come up with $400 for her parents' chemo drugs and this month's rent. Out in the communal podway, the unemployed squatted over virtual dice, hung laundry, or tried to as the soil storm battered the rusted corridors, sent debris showering down from the ceiling. Esco followed the pod cluster's quantum tangles, discernible from the pipes and electrical cables by their flickering, to her favorite interplanet cafe. No need to pay for time on her personal net connection when she wasn't making money, after all. Her former high school teacher ran the place. He had a soft spot for her, ever since she'd dropped out to Gold Farm full-time when her parents had been transitioned to living in the med pod. Like most Wukayans, he had multiple gigs— teaching virtually behind the cafe desk between running errands for those that spent their days here in VR, usually gaming themselves into oblivion. Nice to see you, Esco. I don't suppose you're here to ask about re-enrolling. Don't joke, Esco grunted. The D-Mods nerfed skeleton caves from 5 million gold to 500,000 per hour. I need a job. She collapsed into an empty VR station in the first row of cubicles. You gotta pay for that, you know. Later. She slid on the VR goggles. The cafe's virtual interface flooded in around her, grand and gaudy, but somehow just as grimy. Her ex-teacher had the head of a rat, and a neon cigarette. He shrugged and went back to reading his manga. Any new MMOs? Sure, lots of new releases. None that we can log into. Esco scowled. More and more game moderators auto-banned Wukayan virtual footprints each day, it seemed. Figured. Earth cared more about maintaining the fake economies of their MMORPGs than providing a means of survival for millions of colonists on the planet of Wukai. Who did it hurt if Esco wanted to play, not for fun, but to farm virtual gold that some lazy Terran would pay real money for? There's a Terran girl in the chat room, though. She's got an... offer. A Terran? Her ex-teacher shrugged. Esco figured it was a troll, but the avatar in the cafe lounge could only belong to a Terran. She had waist-length purple hair for one, and eyes to match. Seeing that, Esco opted not to spring onto one of the floating couches or the rusted mecha suit, that titan of a war machine draped with neon lights. She thudded into a chair. On second thought, maybe she should have switched off her dart avatar at least toned down the detail, the skeleton dust caked on her adamant brawler claws. She could shapeshift into a bear with her totem, but she wasn't sure that would help. Heard you have a job. Yeah, I'm interviewing people. She waited, as if expecting Esco to be the one to start asking questions. I'm an author. Oh, Esco said, that's nice. I'll take you the author said. You're the first girl who applied, you know, who can speak universal Terran, and I can tell you like shopping at Hot Topic, too. Esco blinked. Hot Topic? Like from the ancient Terran net memes? The franchise had made a comeback recently. She'd seen virtual storefronts advertised in Dart. But quantum export was expensive. No one around her could pay for throwback goth-slash-emo fashion. There are no hot topics on Wukai, Esko said. Um, that might be a problem. What are you an author of? Elegy of Mortals? It's like one of the most popular net novels on lit fanfic. Millions of readers. It's a Mega Saint 2.0 high school AU fic. Maybe you've heard of it? Esko hadn't. I need to know what the job is. You're going to be my friend. But you'll be paying me. Yeah, I mean, it's like an acting job. You'll only be pretending to be my friend, who's also from Wukai, the author added quickly. I just haven't been able to get in touch with her lately. Here, I'll send you a bunch of messages between us so you can get an idea of her personality and stuff. I'll need you to have all of this read and be ready by tomorrow. It became immediately obvious to Esco upon seeing the friends messages that they had been written by the author herself. 
At first, she just felt sorry for her. The author must not have anybody who wanted to be friends with her in real life. Because if this Wu Kaian friend was real, why not just ask Esko to find her? Then again, why make this friend Wu Kaian in the first place? Still, a job was a job. Tomorrow, Esko asked, be ready for what? Oh, nothing much. Just to chat with some of my other friends. The next Terran night, which Esko still wasn't entirely sure, even after constant explanations about planetary rotations that the author understood, was different from Wu Kayan night. Esko met her in a popular Terran virtual chat room. Esko tottered, uncomfortable in her newly gifted avatar, as the author wove her arm through hers and they clicked into an elevator. In its mirrored walls, they could pass for twins, purple and pink-haired girls with big boobs, decked out in hover heels and black dresses with way too many belts and buckles. If the questions get too hard, don't say anything, the author said. Too hard, Esko wondered. Wasn't this supposed to be a party? Soiree, the author called it, between friends? The doors slid open to a penthouse. Floor-to-ceiling panes alternated between the socials and views of the rest of the virtual city. Over a cushion pit, neon words floated. Literary night, ask me anything. XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX, author of Elegy of Mortals. Everywhere, avatars stood, sat, lounged. Unlike Wukai, where people used whatever style they could afford or pirate, all these figures were human. Like the authors, they had hyper-realistic expression tracking, which made them uncanny. Their eyes, dead. You didn't say there were going to be this many people here, Esko hissed. The author ignored her, plowing through the crowd. They stopped a few paces from the cushion pit. The prettiest avatars of the entire room sprawled there. The author had informed Esko these were other authors, in fact, the most popular ones on lit fanfic. Here she is, my friend from Wukai. She exists? Yeah, Esko said, I exist. A beep from the bot sniffing at her heel verified her virtual footprint was indeed Wukayan. The other authors stared at her, their lips politely stretching into shark smiles. She felt more like an embattled Terran commander at a war crime tribunal, not a guest at a soiree. What's your name? What pod cluster in Wukai are you from? How did you write Chapter 6 of Elegy of Mortals and upload to the Terran net when there was a planet-wide outage on Wukai? My friend, the author cut in, won't be answering any of those questions. You know how difficult it is for a Wukayan to out herself on the Terran net. What's the name of the implied double agent in Season 13 of Mecha State 2.0? I just said she's not going to be answering those questions, the author bellowed. My friend could be prosecuted by her home planet authorities. Persecuted, Esko said. Is it that bad? All heads turned to Esko for once. I could be shot by the Wukayan authorities, she said, just for being here. It wasn't even that much of an exaggeration, Esko realized, as her words sent a shockwave of ooing and tittering through the room. Technically, Wukayans were only allowed on a Terran-approved list of sites. Though interplanet compliance rarely slapped more than a fine on anyone that didn't, for example, Storm Gaming live streams en masse screaming about Terran tyranny, and shot was a bit archaic. More likely, you'd be thrown out of your pod cluster to brave the deserts that covered 90% of Wukai and get eaten by a Niku. The social screens lit up with posts. The author settled into the cushion pit while the crowd converged, putting their hands on Esko's shoulders, saying things like, thank you for risking your life to come here. You're so brave. Shaking their heads gently, I'm sorry we didn't believe you. This is the problem with Terran society. We need to be better. Esko's head whirled. She'd said, like, one sentence. What the hell was wrong with these people? That went great, Esko, the author squealed the second they stepped back in the elevator. Great! I want more. More? Are you free the same time next week? This Terran girl, XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX, pays me to roleplay. 
Esko's clanmates, assembled in the corner of a crowded marketplace in Dart, shifted uncomfortably. From their scorched armor, feathers, and weird potion ingredients sticking out of their inventories, they'd resorted to truly desperate measures for making gold in her absence. Role play? Is it a sex thing? In her sleeping pod, Esko paused Season 2, Episode 12 of Mecha Saint 2.0. The author had told her she needed to watch all 300-plus episodes by their next meeting, so she had no choice but to go at four times speed, keeping one eye on it and her VR goggles over the other. Luckily, the brief action scenes where anything happened were interspersed with long episodes of monologues that she could mostly consult the author's character sheets to get the gist of. Everyone had a sentence or two of personality and backstory, then paragraph upon paragraph summarizing their most popular romantic ships. Black text was canon material, while neon pink was what the author had fixed in Elegy of Mortals. There was a lot of pink. I don't think so. You gotta think outside of the box, Esco. You know how these Terrans are. Does it matter if it's a sex thing if she pays 40 Terran dollars a session, Esco snapped, and you get a cut? The semi-legal dark gold trading market, turned out, was the best way to anonymously transfer money from the author to her. Esco walked the author through the steps, basically what her gold farming clan did in reverse. The author would buy billions in gold, transferring it to a mule dart account. Esco would pick it up on the edge of the game world, an icy wasteland far from the demod's watchful gaze. She'd distribute it to her clan, who'd sell it back for Terran dollars in exchange for 10%. Their rival clan, Hunterfam, wanted to get in on the action too, but Esco brushed off their grandiose threats of bringing her whole, quote, operation tumbling down. Was it a sex thing? To answer that, Esco would need to know who the author really was. But that turned out to be one of the biggest mysteries on the Terran net. The lit fanfic elite, who'd all friended the author by now and even liked her socials posts occasionally, had revealed themselves long ago, turning their net fame into appearances at virtual cons, writing workshop classes you could take for the low, low price of hundreds of Terran dollars, and sponsors. But the author had done none of these things. The only clues Esco had came from Elegy of Mortals itself. From the setup, a violet-eyed girl being recruited to Mecha Saint 2.0's military academy after showing off her innate supernatural mecha suit piloting abilities and romancing everyone in sight, the author had to be Esco's age. Esco herself had grown out of such self-inserts years ago, but generally, people grew up faster on Wukai. True, Esco did feel icky at the now-weekly literary soirees the author dragged her to. The author let her customize her avatar after the first so she could be more comfortable, so smaller boobs and a skin and hair color that was actually hers. In fact, make her hair even redder, her skin even darker, the author had insisted. And the author got to lounge in the cushion pit with all the other authors while Esco got dragged around the room and asked really stupid questions. Like, did the extra gravity on Wukai and having to live in pods really make people shorter and stupid? But that wasn't really a sex thing. More of a prodding at an exotic animal like a chained-up Neku thing. So Esco read Elegy of Mortals author notes. Jackpot. The author couldn't resist sprinkling them before, in the middle of, and after each chapter. Usually real comments Esco had made while reading universal gushing praise. But occasionally there was some back and forth and drama. Like once, Esco had allegedly stolen a virtual pet, and she and the author didn't talk for two months. And... I'm the co-author of Elegy of Mortals? Only chapters 5 through 6, 30, 42, and 80 to 90, the author said. What's so special about those? Well, they take place on Wukai. Why do they take place on Wukai? The author took a deep breath. Around them wavered the VR patio of a trendy Terran vaporwave bakery they'd taken to meeting at. The author had even insisted on ordering virtual strawberry shortcakes they could pretend to eat. Esco couldn't think of anything more Terran. Well, the author said, fake chewing. I got really interested in space colonist rights when we had all those protests on Earth, like five years ago. 
I was just starting high school and saw a vid of that Terran peacekeeping tank run over all those Wukayan students. It spoke to me. As the author of a Mecha Saint 2.0 fanfic with millions of readers on lit fanfic, I had to do something. Bring awareness. And did you hear about the Space Colonist New Voices Award? Now that it's opening up to fanfiction, we can. Esco knew all about it. The Terrans had been spamming submission calls for the New Voices Awards all over the Wukayan net lately. Like the concept hadn't been hastily cobbled together after yet more footage of Terrans mowing down yet more Wukayans in the university pod cluster surfaced last month, triggering yet another round of protests on Earth. There's no way Elegy of Mortals will win that kind of award, Esco said. What? Esco tried to explain. The author didn't even know that cars could not drive across the surface of Wukai due to the fineness of the Sharon, the planet's dusky soil. Ordinary goods had to be transported on sleds pulled by Neki, a kind of lizard-like creature bioengineered from the planet's draconic native life form, Neku. When Earth had invaded, they'd been forced to haul everything on the backs of their mecha suits. That's why the Wukayan Independence War had lasted so long. Not because the Wukayan rebels had mutated into scaly subhumans that could live underground, as the propaganda, which even Terran authorities admitted was super space colonists now, claimed. Did you even get a Wukayan to read this? All of it, it's wrong. Then fix it! How can I fix it when it's already published? I do it all the time, the author said. Patch up plot holes. The only copy of Elegy of Mortals is on lit fanfic, you know. I hired security bots to wipe all others, even the originals on my VR set. It gets updated in real time, across all reader devices. You can change whatever you want. No one will be able to prove it was edited. But this wasn't exactly fixing plot holes, Esco thought. The award consideration deadline was in three days, so she only had time to fix the net novel's problems on the most surface level. Descriptions of the home pod cluster that the self-inserts Wukayan friend had invited the entire Mecha Cadet class to. The author seemed to be under the impression that they had indoor pools and malls and palm trees, like some kind of freaking resort. She axed the entire beach volleyball tournament arc. The author put her foot down on the kidnapped by Wukayan rebels arc, though. The best Esco could do was redeem the rebel captain by making him realize that the Mecha Cadets were just children, after all. And what he was doing was no better than his own tragic childhood, really, and then shooting himself in the head. The author refused to let him survive, but Esco succeeded in not making him a romantic interest, at least. Don't hold your breath, Esco told the author as she sent the submission seconds before the cutoff. We're not going to win. They won, of course. Art inspires change. That's why I write. At the VR awards ceremony, Esco wound up at the foot of the stage while at the podium, the author gave the acceptance speech. It'd be easier this way, the author had explained. The Terrans would have trouble understanding her accent. The author never had a problem understanding Esco, even if she did have an accent. And there was always the risk that Esco could forget something and screw it up. She could come up and hold the trophy at the end. Fan fiction especially draws inspiration from its source material, the author continued. Mecha Saint 2.0 has always upheld the dignity of its space colonist characters. Remember the last episode of season 17, right before the hiatus, when Scarlet Crow promised Mecha Saint Maria that he would stay with the Terran holdouts until the end, that he wouldn't defect to the Wukayan rebels. When Maria found his mecha suit, scorched and abandoned, you all assumed that he'd lied, because he was a space colonist. Because that's what space colonists do. But when season 18 finally aired, we found out Scarlet Crow did fight until the end, even stepping out of his mecha suit to keep shooting the rebels when it broke down, and he did get incinerated for Maria. Hashtag I believe in Scarlet Crow. Hashtag I believe in space colonists. Hashtag I believe in Wukai. That triggered thunderous applause to Esco's disbelief. During the ensuing cocktail hour, the author held court, arm around Esco, champagne glass in her other hand. They wore matching, shimmering gowns, and Esco set her avatar to perma-smile for all the net journalists. The author got most of the questions, of course. I've been meaning to ask, XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX, how did you meet your Wukayan friend? It's not like communication between the Terran and Wukayan nets was ever easy, especially five years ago when you started writing Elegy of Mortals. 
The author took a deep breath. There's something I've never told you guys, but I've wanted to all these years. Even Esco perked up at that. Had the author somehow gotten virtually drunk? Thank you for being such a welcoming community. I finally feel comfortable enough to say it. I... I... I was born on Wukai to my mom and a Terran Mecha captain. Esco couldn't breathe. My pod cluster was caught in the fighting and destroyed by rebels in the Wukayan Independence War. I was eight years old. My mom gave me to my dad, the Terran Mecha captain, and he flew me out just in time. I literally watched my family's pod blow up below me. Of course, when my dad got back to Earth, he couldn't admit who I was, so he gave me to my current family, who always wanted a child, but could never have one. I'm so lucky, the author sniffled, to have been so loved. Esco didn't waste any time dragging the author back into the elevator. She couldn't even wait until they'd reached the ground floor. Why the hell did you say you were Wukayan? Well, half Wukayan, the author giggled. I practically am. I hang out so much with you at this point. But why? Isn't it obvious? The author sighed at Esco's look. Because it's cool to be Wukayan. Cool? Esco gritted her teeth as the author went on and on about how everyone was talking about space colonist rights and how no one was listening to all her ideas about how to make Terran Wukayan relations better, but now they would, and read Elegy of Mortals, too. Wukai wasn't a store, like Hot Topic, that you could go into and browse, hack out bits and pieces of history and culture and guts to wear like a fashion statement. It was everything. Why'd you make up all that about the Terran Mecha captain and the rebels? Well, it had to be realistic. How else would I have gotten to Earth? It's not realistic at all. I'm sorry, Esco. I should have consulted you. We can retcon it. Esco struggled. I lived through the Terran Wukayan War. You don't understand what Earth did to us. I do. We had to learn about it in school and stuff. When I was actually eight, Esco continued, we had to run because we heard the Terrans were coming. All the adults, my parents, even though my mom and dad were just mechanics, stayed to fight the mecha suits. The kids and old people put on as many layers of thermal on as we could and took as much food as we could. We ran across the deserts to the mountains. The Terrans kept bombing us. A lot of us died that way. We couldn't even get the bodies because the Neku picked them off. After a week, we ran out of food. We had to go back. Esco wouldn't talk about those next days. The stench of burning plastic. The mecha suits that stood sentry all around the pod cluster. Massive titans of star steel. Their arms outstretched. Dozens of rebels hanged from their fingers. My mom and dad were still alive, but they'll be sick from radiation for the rest of their lives. And the Terrans, they took my older brother. I never saw him again. I'm sorry, Esco. I had no idea. Esco was crying now. She hadn't thought of her brother in years. She thought she was over it. The stories she only learned when she was older, how the Terrans had used conscripted Wukayans as meat shields just to preserve their multi-billion dollar mecha suits from dents or scratches. Stories they could cry fake tears over now that Wukai was safely subjugated again. The author was holding her now, virtually, saying she understood. Why did Esco have to relive all this shit just for some Terran idiot to understand? I wish you'd told me. I wish I'd never taken this fucking job. That must be it, Esco thought. The author had gotten what she wanted, after all. Influence, a fan base forever loyal to her in the name of showing that they were good Terrans, that they supported space colonists, and a Terran publishing mega conglomerate had even offered her a memoir book deal. All wrapped up in a perfectly crafted excuse for not revealing her identity. Even as Esco tried to bury herself in Dart again, disintegrating skeleton dragon after skeleton dragon, she saw the advertisements for the author's upcoming book. 
Same space, same sky. How I rediscovered my identity and home planet through writing fan fiction. Like a bad dream, she thought. That would be the last remnant of the author in her life. But a couple of Terran weeks later, the author's voice floated into her sleeping pod, a ghost in Wukai's second moonrise. Esko! Esko, I need you! Because of course she did. Esko groggily stumbled over to her VR station. She didn't have to go far. It was trending all over the interplanet. Hashtag Elegy of Mortals exposed! The usual menagerie of Wukaian avatars, side by side with Terran ones in suits and prim dresses, in the same live stream clip played over and over again. We are Hunter Fam, a D'Artagnan gold farming clan from Wukai. And we are a community of concerned lit fanfic readers. Together we have irrefutable evidence that XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX is lying about her connection to the colony of Wukai. We don't have the real name of her Wukaian friend or a face ID, but we do have the last four numbers of her VR footprint, and that's enough. A visual. Two numbers morphed into shooting stars, soaring over a list of virtual locations, glowing when they came close, remaining dark when they did not. As you can see, the Wukaian friend's profile did not interact with that of XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX until a certain day, three Terran months ago. A day we can confirm, through dark real money transaction records that Hunter Fam collected in-game, that corresponds to when XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX started paying this friend for the service of corroborating her made-up life story, presumably. We're only asking for one thing, XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX. Do a face reveal. Come clean. Do the right thing, or we'll make you. After the initial shock faded, relief flooded Esco. It was over. How are we going to get out of this one? The author whimpered. We're not, Esco said. Just like Hunter Fam said, you have to come clean. Okay. But she should have known the author had agreed too easily. When she started live-streaming on the socials, it wasn't with a face reveal, not even in an avatar designed to evoke pity. No hoodie, no running makeup, no bloodshot eyes to make it look like she'd been awake, pondering her response ever since the news broke. The author stood in a pair of neon butterfly wings and her favorite black, covered-with-belts dress. She smiled as if a bit afraid. There's something I haven't been telling you. But I promise, it's all for good reason. I want to start off by saying everything those lit fanfic readers and Hunter fans said is true. The person I've been bringing to the VR chat rooms isn't the person I said she was. She isn't my Wukayan friend. I have been paying her to pretend. Because my Wukayan best friend is dead. The author started crying. Trying to. She huffed and puffed and virtual tears came out. She's been dead ever since the rebel attack on my pod cluster when I was eight. I later learned that Terran troops had taken her. Not good people, like my dad and his mecha crew. They used her and other kidnapped Wukayans as human shields. I struggled with that for a long time. Knowing that most Terrans were good, but others, a small minority, could be truly evil. That's why I haven't been honest with you. Esco wasn't listening. She leaned back and pushed up her VR goggles. That would freeze her avatar, T-posed and gape-mouthed. But she didn't care. She could barely stand to hear the author's voice when she returned to her, let alone look at her. Why did you say I was dead? Esco, don't you see? This was the only way to save it. Look. On the socials, Elegy of Mortals was trending again. Hashtag, I believe in butterfly. It all makes sense with her past. The VR footprints, a split personality, scripting some actor to play the forbidden half of her history. But Hunter Fam says they've met the fake friend. You really believe a bunch of gold farmers? XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX only lied in the first place because of Terran pressure. Because we wouldn't believe her. It makes sense. That she wouldn't want to talk about it. And well, I'll get more people reading Elegy of Mortals if they feel sorry for me because my best friend is dead. And there's no more use for me now that you're Wukayan, is that it? 
Esco, don't be like that. I'll still need your help with making things realistic. It's over. No, wait, I'll pay you more, the author whispered, an amount that gave Esco pause even now. Could she really afford to say no? There was no way she'd find another job as well-paying as this. She'd been saving, hoping to move her parents to a better medical pod. She hadn't spoken to them much since all this started. I'll think about it, Esco said, hating herself. But the author didn't give her time to think. Her shrill voice invaded Esco's sleeping pod only a few Terran hours later. Esco! Esco! They're on my lit fanfic account! I can't... I can't log in! What am I supposed to do about it? The attackers! They're from Wukai! They blocked all Terran virtual footprints! Payback, Esco thought. Serves the Terrans right. She slipped on her VR goggles. No one was in the login lobby of lit fanfic at this hour. She entered the password the author had given her. To her surprise, the account swung open. So the attackers really hadn't thought to block her. Underestimated yet again. Or they didn't think she would actually go in like a necky at the author's command. Paragraphs of pink text, cover art, streamed past her. She'd never been on this side of the net novel before. She could hear the guffaws of the others logged in, Hunter fam trawling for info about the author to sell to their Terran cronies, no doubt. She opened a virtual chat window. I'm in. Oh my gosh, the author sighed in relief. See the security panel? Yeah, that's it. Kick everyone off the account. Return the access to me. That's it. Esco's hand hovered over the interface, as if it had taken on a life of its own. Why should I? Are you kidding me? The author exploded. It's my account, my net novel. But people are only interested in Elegy of Mortals because of the Wukai chapters, right? And I practically wrote those. Are you joking? You only got to write them because of me. You didn't even want to. I had to force you to. You're only famous because of me. No, you're only famous because you pretended to be Wukayan. Because you pretended about all that stuff with the war. Because you pretended to be me. Don't flatter yourself. It could have been anyone else. Esco was stunned at how quickly the author's voice warped. It could have been anyone. I had the pick of everyone on your shitty planet. You're nothing. You should be grateful. Don't be so uppity, you Kyan worm. Esco shut the chat window and blocked her. With a flick, everybody else. All virtual footprints, save her own. That gave her plenty of time to ransack the profile. That's when Esco realized. The author didn't even exist in relation to this lit fanfic account anymore. She hadn't put any of her real information in, and she'd never told it to Esco either. Only all those fake stories, so who knew whether Esco actually knew anything about her after all? Do the right thing, Hunter Pham had said. Anyone could be the owner of this account now. Anyone. Esco took a deep breath and turned off her avatar. In its place appeared a real vid of herself disheveled, yet glowing from the light of her VR set. She opened a socials window and just started live-streaming, knowing somewhere out there some fans would watch and someone would record it, and it would never be lost. She waited for them to come. Do the right thing. She could log off, leave the account dormant, inaccessible. Or she could reach out and take it. A platform was a platform, after all. If Esco struck out on her own, a solitary Wukayan, she'd never, never get as many readers as this. Why not take advantage of that audience? She could fix Elegy of Mortals, be a better Wukayan advocate than the author ever could, turn the net novel into a force for good. But what good could ever come out of a steaming pile of shit like Elegy of Mortals? Do the right thing. She leaned in and spoke to the invisible masses. My name is Esco. You might know me as XX Butterfly Dragon Empress Queen XX. That's right. I'm the author of Elegy of Mortals. And now I'm going to delete it.
I enjoyed this story by Andrea Cruz so much, I immediately went to look at what else she's written and then read a whole bunch of her other stories as well. Her title story of her forthcoming collection, Learning to Hate Yourself as a Defense Mechanism, also looks at similar themes of gaming and storytelling and appropriation, but deals with them in a different way, exploring a different subset of things that can happen at the intersection of these topics. One of the things I really enjoyed in Chris's work, in addition to these beautifully explored thematic elements, is the richness and complexity she gives her tech worlds, and worlds in general for that matter. I could easily slip into the virtual world she created here and believe in their existence. I loved all the details of the VR world of D'Artagnan, as well as all the avatars and chat rooms that pop up in the story as Esco talks to the author. Like, the matching avatars the author initially creates for Esco and herself to wear. Or the description of the meeting in a vaporware bakery, and of course, the author orders virtual strawberry shortcakes. The richness and complexity of the virtual worlds they navigate gives the stories a marvelous grounding. And that grounding, of course, gives a marvelous jumping off point for a story that explores the ramifications of anonymity and appropriation. Who can tell these stories? Who gets awards for these stories? And what happens when you can instantly retcon and no one can prove you didn't? We never get an unmasking of the author, of course. Because, of course, in the end, what matters is what Esco decides to do. Escape Bud is a production of Escape Bird Inc. and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Don't change it, don't sell it, please go forth and share it. How do you share it, you ask? Well, in addition to your social media of choice, consider rating and or reviewing us on podcast listening sites such as Apple or Google. More reviews, especially like stellar ones, makes for more discoverability, makes for more Escape Pod, for you. Escape Pod truly relies on the generous donations of listeners exactly like you. Yes, I am actually talking to you right now. So, if you enjoyed our story this week, then consider going to escapepod.org or patreon.com slash eapodcast and honestly, anything helps truly. Go there and cast your vote for more stories that Hashtag totally believe in Butterfly. By the way, Patreon subscribers have access to exclusive merchandise and can be automatically added to our Discord where you can chat with other fans as well as our staff members. Our opening and closing music is by Daikaiju at daikaiju.org. And our closing quotation this week is from Chelsea Kane in Let Me Go, who said... Give someone anonymity, and all social niceties break down. Thank you for listening, and have fun.